Okay, great to be here and great to see you all here for this day on the history of emotions, which I think is a really important and interesting topic. Um, almost all the exciting work that's being done on this topic at the moment is from, is, is from historians. And psychologists, I think, have been a little bit slow to get in on it. I, I'm very pleased, therefore, that we have this day on the history of emotions organised by the British Psychological Society, and I hope quite a few psychologists here. And one of my sort of change the world objectives in, uh, in this day is to get psychologists a bit more interested in the history of emotions and in what historians are doing there. So um, I, that's, um, that's, that's where I'm going with this. And, and the talk has evolved, really. The title I gave myself originally is no longer quite appropriate. It's really more about how I hope historians and psychologists can collaborate in studying the history of emotions. I'm the only psychologist in the lineup here today, which is a reflection of the poverty of psychological involvement in the history of emotions. So I'm going to make a sort of psychological pitch, probably a bit more than the other speakers. I want to start by saying something about the history of the concept of emotion. It may seem as old as the rocks and just so obvious you don't need to think about it, but actually the concept of emotion as we have it now is a modern development. And it develops in two stages, I think. There's a first stage in early modernity, the 17th century, that um, I, my, my main source for this bit is Owen Barfield's classic book, History in English Words. He dates the development of a language for interior experience from about uh, 1660, the restoration of the monarchy in, in, in 17th century Britain. Um, we got a new language then for talking about our inner life and various existing words were hijacked and put to new uses. That's what tends to happen rather than making up new words. And before that time, emotion was used about material objects, not about people. And talk of a person emoting was an extension of an established usage about things emoting. And something rather similar happened to the word depression. Both words were part of this new language for interiority. And various other words changed their meaning as well. Fear came to refer, as it does now, to an emotional state rather than to a sudden and unexpected event. And sad came to mean unhappy rather than heavy or sated as it had before. So it's very difficult, I think, for us to sort of feel our way back into the language that, was, um, that we had before this 17th century development of words for interior life. But really, it's the concept of emotion as we have it starts then. Further changes came about 200 years later in what you might call late modernity, around 1860, roughly. And the first recorded usage of most derivatives from the word emotion date from that time. Words like emotional, emotionalism, emotionalist, emotionalize, these all come into usage around, uh, around 1860. And they seem to reflect a new concept of emotionality as a personality trait. It seems we didn't really think about emotionality until that time, and emotionality has obviously become a core concept in personality psychology. And I wonder whether a number of other personality trait words originate at the same time. I haven't done the research to track that through, but it would be an interesting project for someone. And around this time, just shortly afterwards, there was a scientization of the concept of emotion, in which probably the two key developments were Darwin's 1870 book on the expression of the emotions and William James' classic paper of 1984. Though the present concept of emotion wasn't introduced by, by psychologists, as Thomas Dixon, amongst others, has reminded us, uh, but, um, 
Brown, the Scottish philosopher, was important too. It was psychology that really took up this concept of emotion and ran with it in a big way and has done ever since. So much so that I think we've forgotten there was ever any other way of conceptualizing what we now call emotions. It just seems so obvious. There are, of course, words for um, what we now think of as emotions but that go back um, to er earlier periods before the 17th century. But they tend to refer to observable behavior or to moral issues. They're not really used about interior states before the 17th century. That's my first little section. And I want to draw attention to two ways in which emotion is an integrative concept that draws together things that don't necessarily have to be brought together. First, no one observes emotion directly. It's a hypothetical construct that integrates various things that we can observe which tend to be coordinated. Changes in how people feel, what's going on in their bodies internally, how they behave, how they think and talk. And there's enough coordination between these things to justify saying that they're all manifestations of emotion. But the linkage between them is far from perfect. I started my career working on behaviour therapy, on the treatment of phobias, and we were getting quite interested at that time in the way there could be a decoupling of the experience of fear and the avoidance behaviour that a lot of phobics showed. My PhD supervisor, Jack Rackman, got interested in how this decoupling hang happens in bomb disposal experts. And this line of interest is reflected in a book he wrote in 1978 on fear and courage. I don't have time here to review all the ways in which the various manifestations of emotion can get decoupled. But I do want to say something about this for the implications of the historical study of emotion. History has largely to work with texts. Historians can't do time travel and observe behavior directly or measure the galvanic skill response of dead figures or ask them what they're feeling. But texts can provide various different kinds of information, at least four, I think. There are texts about emotional regulation and about social attitudes to emotion. And this literature is especially rich for anger, and Peter Steens has built his career on examining texts about emotional regulation. And secondly, there are autobiographical accounts of what people experience. For example, Thomas Dixon's provided some uh, very nice accounts of people describing their tears in his excellent history of weeping. And third, there are indications in historical texts of what people are concerned about. For example, there are periods in which people are very concerned about shame and other periods in which they're more concerned with guilt. And this is reflected, um, it's not only reflected in the use of those actual terms, it can be inferred from what they describe using other terms. And fourth, there are indirect indications of the changing emotional sensitivities people have in changing social practices. For example, nursing care can give us insights into the history of compassion, as we will hear later. Four things, therefore, emotional regulation, emotional experience, emotional concerns, and uh, emotions reflected in social practices. Historians can focus on just one of those, <coughs> though I think it can be misleading if you then draw over general conclusions from it. But I think it's particularly interesting to examine two, three, or even all four of these and to look at the relationship between them. And once again, you can get decoupling as you can in bomb disposal experts. 
For example, what emotions people admit to experiencing may not accord with what emotions they're preoccupied with. Psychotherapists know that. Sometimes people talk a lot about anger but never admit to feeling it. And there's a phenomenon called lexical leakage, delightful term, I think, in which people's emotions seem to leak out in what they talk about more than in what they admit to experiencing. Or they may have alexithymia, another nice term, no words for feelings. People who show signs of experiencing things in their body language that they can't talk about. And people's views about emotional regulation may shed some light on those kind of decouplings. I think the scope for historians to explore such decouplings in the historical period, in the dead. And I think that could be brought into very fruitful dialogue with psychologists exploring those decouplings in the living. And cultural taboos can operate in ways that are similar to personal inhibitions. And I think they can give rise to similar decouplings of the different strands of emotion. And I think that could be a really interesting comparison, the study of emotional decouplings in history and in individual people as studied by psychologists. That's my second section. Emotion is a unifying category in another sense. It brings together, under the same heading, things that had previously been differentiated. The late 19th century liked taxonomies. It liked broad integrative categories of which there could be many examples. Headings under which many things could be brought together. Emotions are one such concept. The so-called sciences are another. Religions are yet another. The problem is that the things that are lumped together under these general headings that the late 19th century liked so much don't always have as much in common as might be supposed. For example, the so-called world religions are enormously different, not just in substance and detail, but in the kind of thing they are. And lumping them together under that heading has caused a lot of confusion. And lumping emotions together sometimes seems like treating apples and oranges as though they were the same kind of thing. The pre-psychological literature sometimes made a distinction between passions and affections, as Jonathan Edwards did in his book on religious affections. And again, I'm very indebted to Thomas Dixon here. And that distinction was swept away in the new psychology of emotions that developed at the end of the 19th century. But, very interestingly, I think something like it had to be reinvented as in the distinction Keith Oatley made between primary and secondary emotions. I like Keith Oatley a lot, by the way. He's one of my heroes in the psychology of emotion. And I think his distinction between primary and secondary emotions is really useful. I'll come back to it. I think he's actually rediscovering something a bit like the old distinction between passions and affections. And this brings me to Paul Ekman. Paul Ekman and his concept of basic emotions. Let's be blunt, historians don't like Paul Ekman. I think almost every book I've read by a historian about emotions contains a rant against Paul Ekman and his concept of basic emotions. Jan Clamper at Goldsmiths College gets especially worked up about it and the rant goes on for a long, long time. It's brilliant and closely argued, but in my view, seriously unbalanced. And another uh, little objective I have in this talk is to try and broker a peace treaty between historians and Paul Ekman. So what is this all about? Paul Ekman proposes a list of basic emotions which are said to be found in a range of different species, each linked to a particular facial expression and which are also pretty much the same across different cultures. There are a number of valid complaints to be made about this. 
the evidence for it is just not as compelling as Paul Lackman makes out. People can't even quite agree about what the basic emotions are. Paul Ekman can't even agree with himself about what they are and proposes different lists at different times, though his standard list is anger, <coughs> disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, surprise. It's highly speculative whether other species feel the same kind of anger, fear, disgust, etc. as humans do. And that can't be safely concluded from noticing the same facial expressions. And Ekman probably exaggerates the degree of cross-cultural uniformity in these so-called basic emotions. As others have pointed out, Anna Weir's Bicker, for example, there's a kind of cultural imperialism in identifying emotions by their English language labels and examining their occurrence in other cultures. I could go on. There are problems with Paul Ekman. And I'm certainly not defending Paul Ekman against all comers. But I do think he has a point. There may not be a hard and fast division between basic and other emotions, but I do think some emotions are more basic than others. And I, I think that emotions are not all the same kind of thing. And I think Keith Oatley was very wise to introduce a distinction between uh, primary emotions and secondary emotions. And primary emotions are a kind of moderated, rehabilitated version of what Ekman calls basic emotions. There are some fundamental distinctions, as I see it, between primary and secondary emotions that makes this an important and convincing distinction. Basic emotions show a greater degree of cross-cultural uniformity than other secondary emotions do. Another term that's been used for, self and for secondary emotions is self-conscious emotions. I think that comes to roughly the same thing. And secondly, basic emotions develop earlier in children than secondary emotions do. You get primary emotions of roughly age two, you get secondary emotions roughly age four. It's not until you get to four that you get the self-conscious or moral emotions like pride, shame, and guilt. So though that different developmental trajectory is for me quite an important reason for making some such distinction. And thirdly, um, some emotions depend on a more developed self-concept than others do. And secondary emotions seem to depend on that more than primary or basic emotions do. And secondary emotions come along with a more developed capacity for perspective taking or theory of mind and a better understanding of social norms. So I think there's quite enough evidence there to support some kind of distinction between primary and secondary emotions and not to lump all emotions together as though they were the same kind of thing. I think I understand why historians don't like Ekman. His position seems to imply that historical and cultural context is unimportant with emotions. I think there's a balance to be found between constitutional and contextual factors. And the relative importance of those two kinds of factors varies from one situation to another. Sometimes, psychologists sometimes try to over-biologize emotions, as I think Ekman does. Historians sometimes tend to under-biologize them. I think both approaches are a mistake, and emotions are too diverse for either approach to work across the board. So my proposed peace treaty between Ekman and the historians is based on some kind of two-factor theory of emotions, such as the one that Stanley Schachter proposed years ago. His version has proved over neat, and the experimental evidence doesn't support it as compellingly as he thought it did. <coughs> 
But I think it's still correct that emotions depend on a complex interaction between, on the one hand, biological and constitutional factors, and on the other hand, contextual and cultural factors. And we need to get really interested in that um, interaction. There are two main naturalistic ways of exploring the contextual cultural factors. Um, in, ad in, ad in addition to the kind of experimental evidence that Schachter um, um, worked on. <clears throat> One is the anthropological approach, and at least some psychologists of religion, like Keith Oatley, have long taken an interest in the implications of the anthropological study of emotions. But the recent development of the historical study of emotions opens up the possibility of a similar dialogue with historians that there already has been between psychologists and anthropologists. A few last words about the scope for dialogue. So far, psychologists have largely ignored the history of emotions, but I urge them to sit up take notice and get engaged. And I believe there could potentially be a very rich dialogue between um, the history and psychology of emotions. And the dialogue looks to get increasingly interesting. So far, historians have spent a good time on what you might call methodological throat clearing. And in this day, we're getting beyond um, considering how historians might study emotions and looking at the history of various specific emotions. And I think that's a step in the right direction. Another potentially valuable approach in the history of emotions is to look at a particular historical period in a particular culture and to survey the emotional experience, behavior, and ideology of that period across a wide range of emotions. And if you get into that and start putting different periods together, I think you find there are some oscillations going on. Oscillations between relatively permissive and relatively restrictive approaches to emotional regulation, for example. And some of that oscillation surfaces in Dixon's work on the history of weeping, periods when it's okay to weep and periods when it's not. And changing patterns in weeping seem to be intertwined with a wider oscillation in permissive or restrictive approaches to morality. Emotions and morality are closely intertwined and disgust, I think, plays a key role in moral regulation by emotion. We'll be hearing more about disgust later. And as the historical study of emotion gathers pace, I hope we'll get a better sense of what correlations there are between different emotions and how they fluctuate from one historical period to another. And I suspect we'll find that fluctuations in different emotions are quite closely linked and the, that there are historical changes in the emotional climate that affect many different specific emotions. And that will call for an exploration of the sources of those historical fluctuations. And psychology may have something to contribute to that. One of my favorite books on the interface of psychology and history is Gordon Rattray Taylor's old book, The Angel Makers, which sketches out an oscillation between what he calls patriarchal and matriarchal periods, an oscillation that involves both emotion and morality. But all that's very speculative, and I'm obviously getting ahead of where research on the history of emotions has yet got to. My point is that I believe there are exciting prospects for work on the interface of psychology and the history of emotions. And I very much welcome the fact that the BPS Center for the History of Psychology has organized this day on the history of emotions. And I look forward to much fruitful collaboration between historians and psychologists in the study of emotion. Thank you. Thank you.